the pandemic has shown is that there are serious problems with how work works. Only 39% of Canadians are able to work from home. You have to answer your email, because if you don't answer your email, then they're going to be like, where are you? Like, are you not working? Are you not doing the job you're supposed to be doing? Who gets to work from home? Who gets to have a shorter work day? There's no reason that gig work should not be part of the Employment Standards Act. Workers who tend to be low wage, who tend to be racialized. If you want to rise to the highest levels possible, you shouldn't encounter barriers because you're a woman. And I'm not just quitting for nothing. It felt like a sign from the universe. And I don't intend to never work again. Maybe it's time to chase your own dreams. Maybe when we go back to something like business as usual, we can maybe construct something better. the office? I am actually at the office in a sea of empty cubicles. Well, I'm at Workhouse today trying to get some things done. I like the idea of a work share space because I don't have to look at my dishes. Um, this stretches a pandemic when you're at home. It feels like we're going back to normal, which is nice. I know our office is about to adopt a hybrid model, which I'm looking forward to. How are you feeling about being back? Well, you know, we're considered essential. So you and I have been in and out of the office from some time. But I'm going to be honest with you, I kind of miss the interactions with some of my colleagues. So coming into the office is going to be something I look forward to. So true. I actually miss seeing people. I think the pandemic has made us rethink how we can change the ideas of what work and workplace could be. We've been given this opportunity to reimagine work. Reimagine work. That sounds quite sexy. You know, there's a lot of buzz about the hybrid model. There's a lot of talk about this four day work week, which sounds sort of, you know, out of this world and in the future. But I think there is a moment in time right now to talk about sort of the inequities in the workplace, like a living wage and sort of the diversity and obstacles and challenges for some of the most marginalized workers. So some interesting topics for sure when we talk about reimagining work. It seems like we're living in a pivotal moment and there's a real desire to change how we work because of what we're doing seems a little bit outdated. But I gotta go. I'm gonna hop on a Zoom call with Aaron Kelly, who's going to give us some insight from Polly. See you soon. Hey, Aaron, it's really nice to see you again. Great to see you, Nam. Uh, you know, the pandemic really brought work and workplace issues to the forefront. According to Polly, how have worker priorities shifted? If we look at the two groups, the people who had the option to go and work from home, they are now rethinking, do they want to go back to the office? And then the people who did not have that opportunity while all their friends were working from home are starting to think, do I want to work in this type of field anymore? Being an essential worker was really, really tough on people during the pandemic. And so we are seeing people everywhere rethink the careers they want to have and the conditions under which they want to work. We're calling this, you know, the great resignation. We've been hearing that a lot. Does Paul, you know why people are quitting? We're seeing people that are resigning without even having another job to go to. So income is taking a real backseat. And people, a lot of people are actually saying money is less important to me now than it used to be. And I'm considering other factors when I look at a job that I want to have. And primary among those are a good work culture, people talking about wanting to have a four day work week or work less, having more flexibility. And these things are more important than money. Uh, pay equity has been a popular talking point during this pandemic. What has Polly uncovered about wage fairness? We're seeing people say things like, it's not that we have a worker shortage in Canada, we have a shortage of employers wanting to pay more for um, workers. In particular, people have been talking about a living wage and saying that $15 to $20 is a more realistic wage, especially for people who are living in urban environments. There was a lot of engagement on these topics, and it came from people making uh, north of $100,000 a year. Why aren't people in the lower income brackets as engaged? They're more engaged on uh, fairness in the workplace, um, racism in the workplace. There's been a lot of discussion on that and how they want that to change. People who are in the 
higher income brackets are the ones who are more concerned about workplace culture and stress and burnout. It's a different kind of stress. It's like the, the stress of your boss and your management, your team, versus the stress that people in lower income positions are feeling, which is the stress of, can I feed my family, especially in a period of high inflation, can I afford to live? You mentioned um, work culture and this move to create these more inclusive spaces. I think this is the, for me, one of the more interesting things that we saw that we'll have more opportunity for racialized individuals to come into the workplace. And we're also seeing that with employers saying, that, yeah, they want to attract those workers as well. What has Polly uncovered about people's true feelings about working from home? On the one hand, people are saying, yeah, I like working from home. I save money on the commute. There's no point in me going downtown just to sit in front of a computer. But we're also seeing people say, if you're in your house 365 days a week, I mean, sometimes your house, your home can be toxic too, right? I mean, sometimes you just need to get away. People want flexibility, but they also want camaraderie. But we, we're not, we're definitely not seeing a big influx of people saying, I want to go back to working five days a week in the office downtown. What does reimagining work mean to those making minimum wage but working highly essential jobs? We're heading to Scarborough to talk to grocery store employee, Natasha Gray. Hi. Hi, I'm here. So nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. How would you describe the past two years as a grocery uh, frontline worker? It's been um, challenging, <laughs> to say the least. Um, it's just been uh, a roller coaster, maybe even a twilight zone sort of aspect. Early on in the pandemic, grocery store workers had a pay rise um, mm -hmm. to acknowledge all the difficult work that you were doing for us, mm -hmm. but then it was taken away. Yes. How did it feel to be acknowledged in the first place, but then for it to be taken away? It felt nice from the employer that it was good, the $2, but at the same time when they took it away, like maybe like three to four months later, you're like, but we're still in a pandemic. We're still out here serving the community, providing service. Why are we not getting that pay? Do you feel like the work that you were doing was being taken for granted? Not from my store owner, but from the company, yes. Mm. So acknowledge that, you know, we are making that effort that we're leaving our house to sacrifice our lives, to go into the grocery store, that we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know who has COVID. We might be bringing it back to our families. In that aspect, I, said, I think they should have kept it and even raised it a little bit more. Because $2, it wasn't really enough. Do you think it was performative? That it was more about appearing to do something, but it didn't really address the fairness? Yeah, it, I, I, I think so. I, I just feel like at the end of the day, they should have just made sure that, you know, you know that we're working, we're out there. Look after us. Make sure that we have at least some sort of sustainable living. You make just under the living wage in the uh, city that you live in. What would uh, a pay raise allow you to do? To go on vacation. <laughs> no, not vacation, but like now, I mean, I'm fortunate that I have my husband, you know, he has a very good job. But if I had to be out there by myself, I would not survive. I know that. It's hard out there. Yeah. And they need to raise at least $20, $21 for us to make a substantial living. What would uh, additional sick days mean for your line of work? Just security. Knowing that, you know, if I'm sick, it's okay. Take the time. Rest yourself. Come back to work when you're healthy. What is the government saying to us as people that we're not, we're not worthy of those sick days? Like, everybody needs a sick day. Mm -hmm. Make policies that work. Make policies that will help the people. Sometimes it feels like the middle class is suffering because, you know, people who are hierarchy are, or government is making these decisions. And I'm like, you need to walk a day in our shoes to understand where we're coming from.
we've been hearing a lot about the great resignation during the pandemic. Right now, we are on our way to Unionville to speak to Aksa Malik, who quit her job during the pandemic, and we're going to find out why. So tell me about your journey to becoming a city planner. It started when I entered university and I had no idea what I wanted to do. I um, tried multiple different programs until I found City Studies and once I found it, it felt like a language that I completely understood. I went to grad school and then from there worked my way to where I was working as a planner. To do all that education mm -hmm. and all that planning, mm -hmm. you get to a place where you have a position mm -hmm. um, and then you decide to leave that position. It's not a question you ask yourself after you've worked so hard to get to that place. But when I got there, I found while I enjoyed it, there was something that was missing. What was missing for you? I'm not sure what was missing. I'm just sure that it wasn't. It, it wasn't for you? Yeah, it wasn't for me. I enjoyed learning about it. There's so many amazing things about city planning, the environment, community development. I could go on mm -hmm. about that. But when it comes to the actual job, I didn't feel the value that I thought I would in the career path that I had chosen when I was 18, 19. Mm -hmm. And I think when uh, a lot of us can mm -hmm. relate to that, uh, mm -hmm. you kind of think, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And then you get to that place and you're like, oh, no, this is not what I want mm -hmm. to do. And then you decide to quit. Yeah. What led to that? I quit my job because I increasingly didn't enjoy what I was doing. I got an opportunity to work on more senior level projects, but they weren't fulfilling. Um, the job is stressful, and I'm not going to uh, say it wasn't, but it became more difficult to stay in my job than to quit it. And quitting wasn't an easy decision. I made it because I didn't know what was next, but I know this wasn't it and I knew I couldn't stay any longer, otherwise it would impact my mental health. What was the reaction from your friends and family? Mixed. <laughs> Definitely a mixed reaction. I didn't tell anybody until I had made the decision and put in my resignation letter because I knew the reaction would be mixed. Mm -hmm. Quitting a job that you worked so hard for, something that was stable, something that, you know, um, is seen as a great place to be, is not seen, I think, favorably, favorably by everybody. Were you scared? <laughs> very scared. <Yeah. laughs> I was very scared. It, it's not something that somebody prepares you for. Navigating a career, who knows how to do that? You know how to get there, but everything you do after that is all on you. But uh, it's true, yeah. because you can work somewhere for so long. It's like a relationship that yeah. you don't know how to walk away from. I was right? so sad. I was crying, yeah. <laughs> handing in my resignation letter. It's not fun to do. It's mm -hmm. not, but I know it was right. You ever have situations where you wake up and say, wow, did I quit my job? Did I do that? I had it a couple months ago. <laughs> I would think, wow, never did I ever imagine I would quit a job. Nobody tells you it's okay to quit. It's not something that crosses your mind. You work at the place you work, neither you find another job or you, know, you excel at what you're currently doing. Quitting, it just seems like a and maybe I'm just reaching out here, but a revolutionary act. It's like saying, I choose me. I trust myself and I know it'll work out against all odds of people saying, don't do that. You don't know what the outcomes will be. You don't know the uncertainty that's out there. Mm -hmm. So what's next then? I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea, but I'm at a place where I trust myself. I know it'll work out. And you know what? I'm a great worker. <laughs> I am. I. I really value the work I do. I really work hard at what I do. So whatever it is, I'm sure it'll be fine. My name is Vas Bednar. I'm the Executive Director of McMaster University's Master of Public Policy and Digital Society program, where I'm also an adjunct professor of political science. One of the biggest changes in this pandemic is how we look at work, how we approach work. What have you seen as the biggest change these past two years when it does come to work? I think everyone's relationship with their job or their work has been revolutionized, but in different ways. As time passed, I think our relationship with work evolved even further because when you strip away maybe the fancy office or the commute or some of the theater of work, mm. it's forced people to kind of reconcile with you know, who they are, who they want to be, what they're working on, is that meaningful for them, or do they want a new skill? And I actually think that's, that's really productive.
but it's worth remembering that the pandemic has been traumatic, but in different ways for different people. So I think for the subset of people that were able to stay home and work, the key message about state of emergency and work you know, be productive, uh, keep keep things as, as normal as you can be has been difficult, especially in a mental health capacity. Mm -hmm. But for people, again, whose work was paused or eroded or who were forced to continue working and weren't able to work from home, right? Our frontline workers of all kinds, uh, traumatic and challenging in a different way, mm -hmm. being put at risk, not fully understanding what that risk is and maybe not having the power to advocate for some of the protections they needed or wanted. So the thread uses uh, insights from AI Polly. Yeah. And one of the things that uh, Polly found was there's a conversation happening around work-life balance. I think it is a positive thing that came out of the pandemic. So it's not only, again, for those more mobile workers that have a bit more power or who are looking for guardrails in their work-life balance as a perk of sorts, mm -hmm. but also hardcore policy, right? Big P policy. Uh, we've seen the province experiment with bringing forward the right to disconnect. Right. Right. So after certain hours, I don't want to get an email. Oh, I don't have to pay attention to the email that right. I get. Sometimes you have 25 hours of work to get done in that week or you get it done a little bit faster. So why shouldn't the worker be able to have more flexible time? Do you think that the pandemic has created a situation where we can talk more about pay equity? I'm hoping we can talk more about pay equity. One worry I have for the province and for Canada when it comes to policymaking is that we're still so resistant to geographic specific policy interventions. We know that the cost of living, there's a huge range all across Ontario, but we have these set rates and we know that the minimum wage doesn't go as far in, say, Toronto as it might somewhere else. So, you know, that's why the living wage movement is so important. Yeah. But we're starting to see restaurant workers are able to push for more ethical and more equitable standards of work. And they're not going to put up with the norm, the very hostile and kind of... Um, norm before that exploited them mm -hmm. so much. That's a good thing. Yeah. And let's take that and bring that to pay equity and more transparency when we see even job postings at the most basic level. What do we take from what happened during the pandemic uh, to implement moving forward in how we reimagine work? I think there have been a, a lot of great sub conversations. One of them is also around how we communicate online, mm -hmm. more inclusive language, more neutral language, the ability to use tools other than email, Slack, Microsoft Teams to have conversations, to express yourself. I think that's useful. Not everyone's comfortable or has the airtime to, to speak up in a physical meeting. Being able to work from home or have a hybrid model, we're seeing people self-report uh, better happiness levels, a better sense of, of work-life balance. Before, we saw the answer from some employers say, no, you can't, mm -hmm. we can't have you work from home. We can't make these exceptions for you, but it's not an exception anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think that will be a durable part of the future of work and the, the choice and the empowerment that more workers have that didn't before. Hey, Jan. Hey, Nan, how's it going? I just got back from speaking to a young woman by the name of Aksa Malik, and she said something that I've never heard before. She said that quitting was revolutionary. You know what? That doesn't surprise me in today's climate. With the shift in balance of power from employee to employer, you look at short contracts, you look at the gig economy as well. And we have more contract work, which is creating an imbalance. I think the pandemic has forced us to figure out how to make work work for everybody. And a place that's grappling with that is the township of Zora. They participated in a pilot project and implemented a four-day work week. I'm curious to find out how that works. Where are you off to? I'm actually headed off to Ottawa. I'm going to talk to Sharon Nangueso. She's the CEO and founder of Quake Lab, and they're a consultancy firm that works with employers to build equitable workplaces, which we know from Pauly that that's top of mind for a lot of Ontarians. Well, drive safely, because I know how you're driving is. No, 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 you're a great driver. Thank you, thank See you. See you later, Jane. See you later. Hey, Sharon. Hi, finally, come on in. Sharon, thank you so much for welcoming us to your beautiful home. Um, as you know, equity in the workplace is top of mind for lots of Ontarians. And so we want to talk to you because this is kind of what you do. 
We use design thinking to radically shift um, the way people come into work, the way work is designed and organized, and the way people experience the world of work. And we do that by working really closely with clients to focus more on systemic change rather than behavior change. Prior to the pandemic, it seemed like there was sort of a growing buy-in into the principles of diversity and inclusion. We saw a lot of organizations, government institutions, um, industries writ large doing what we call aesthetic diversity. And that is really even in line with tokenism, this idea that the most important part of equity, diversity, and inclusion work is just essentially what we look like. Like if you took a snapshot of our company, look at all of these colors of the world, you know, look, we've got a woman. And that was the focus. And it, that's not great. When uh, the pandemic hit, accommodations were made for all uh, able-bodied people to work from home and do all this stuff. When one or two say, disabled employees wanted to work from home, and it's like, we don't it's do impossible. that. It's impossible. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think first, this is uh, maybe society at large, but also employers, organizations need to do a lot of trust building, I think, especially for existing disabled um, employees. And those are folks who have visible or invisible disabilities. And there's going to need to be a kind of reckoning <laughs> to say, you know what, we messed up. Here's a different way of us working and here's how we're making that possible. It sounds so bare bones, so simple, but at the end of the day, I think folks just need to ask other people, what do you need? There is sort of this shift right now when we talk about sort of the great resignation or mm -hmm. the great migration. The power is sort of with employees at this point. It seems like employers have to go to a sort of a blank slate, start yeah. fresh. So that's where we tend to come in with our work, where we're trying to look at not just what this looks like for everyone, but we're trying to disaggregate that, right? Which is something that we don't do in Canada. We don't use disaggregated data. So we say like really fleeting statements, even when it comes to, you know, the great resignation, we say women have left the workplace. But what does that look like for disabled women? What does that look like for black women, for women who are new immigrants? What does that actually look like? But because we use this fleeting statement that usually goes to the most dominant group within a subgroup, we don't actually see the reality of the situation. You know, employees who don't fit that, you know, the homogenous understanding of who it is we're talking about, to be able to better advocate, to, to have a lot of autonomy in those discussions about going back to work, and even those discussions about burnout, because we know burnout it's not great for anyone. And we've seen people, you know, kind of hit those walls over and over in the last two years. And so if you're not prepared to sit with yourself as an employee, as a business or as an institution and say, we are causing harm to people who are already facing immeasurable amounts of harm outside of our doors, then I have to say you either need to get that together or close your doors because you are causing more harm than good, regardless of what it is you do seems the ball is in the employer's court to it make a decision. Is. When it's making decisions about your future as an organization, if you're not data informed and if that data is not disaggregated, you're just going to keep going into a certain, into a cycle of just, you know, pushing people aside, pushing people aside, pushing people aside. Listen to your people. They know what they need better than you will ever know what they need. And happy people who work for you are, are gonna go the, the mile for you. And I'm saying if you're not making it, worthwhile for it and you're not building specifically for the things they need, you're going to lose them. My name is Don McLeod. I'm Chief Administrative Officer for the Township of Zora. Don, so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. So your initial four-day work week trial was part of a pilot project by researchers from York and Western University. How did Zora come to be involved in this study? We actually uh, requested help from them. We have two recent grads from the MPA program, so they still have good contacts at Western, and um, we reached out to them to help us evaluate how our four-day work week or compressed work week trial was, uh, was being undertaken. And how was it received? Very well received by staff. Uh, they're extremely happy with the four-day work week. Council seems happy with it. We were able to extend our work hours by 12.5% at no cost to the taxpayers. So what were some of the advantages to the staff for having a four-day work week? So those that had daycare, they were able to eliminate one day of childcare. Um, for myself, I have an elderly father, so I'm able to schedule all his appointments on my days off. Just spending time away from the office seems to really have helped people's mental health at work. I mean, it sounds great. Because I'm like, when do I move to Zorro? <laughs> but I'm guessing there must have been a, some challenges. So some of the challenges that we encountered was just scheduling our internal meetings to make sure that uh, 
you weren't scheduling uh, tender closings or scheduling meetings on your days off and just making sure the public knew that our office hours had changed. We've always been big on employee satisfaction and we knew that for the most part our core services were covered uh, five days a week. So we thought, you know, if someone can leave or come in at 8 o'clock and leave at 3.30 or 4, it made them happier and the township business was still being taken care of. So. That's always been our, our core value is to be, uh, be flexible with our work arrangements. Do you think that what you've done will be something that attracts people to come to your community? Definitely. Our employment page after we announced it, we had I think it was a 700% increase in people looking at our uh, job ads that we had online. So we know there's great interest. Um, some of our employees have had calls from friends seeking employment with Zora, so it, it really put us on the map. Did productivity get better with this four-day work week? It hasn't uh, dropped. We've been able to maintain the number of staff reports going to council, our services provided. So we do monitor that, um, but it has made employees happier and they just seem, there seems to be a lightness around the office that wasn't there before. So when you have that, people are taking less sick days. They're just more apt to come into work uh, looking to do a better job. We always talk about the elusive work-life balance. It's like a magical unicorn. <laughs> do you think that this is the missing piece for that? It's maybe not the missing piece, but it certainly has helped bridge that gap. The one thing that we did note was that people thought they would spend more time with families having the extra day off. Did they? No, <laughs> it's, it's not the case because kids are in school, your partner's working. It's given people some more alone time and just the chance to like doctor's appointments, dentist appointments. It's their time, it's their day off. And that's their chance to recharge because we are working longer days. So they do need that, that extra time off to recharge. So we encourage them to not respond to emails. It'll be there when you return to work. So just make sure you unplug. You must feel proud that your community was able to accomplish something that a lot of people have spoken about but haven't put into action. Definitely. It's, you know, when people hear the four-day work week, first thing they think is, oh, you've got a day off, you know, the place is closed. And that's not the case. Um, people think it's hard to do. It's not. It takes just, you know, good cooperation between management and staff. You have to do some planning, but it's not hard to implement. You know, with, with the right uh, supports in place, it can be done very easily. And I think it's made us a better employer. It's just kept us more open to listening to our employees. I'm here to speak to Albert Lai, the CEO of Big Viking Games, and I'm here to talk to him about his company's decision to go fully remote. <laughs> hey, how's, it, how's it going? Welcome. Thank you so much for having us. Come on in. At the beginning of the pandemic, um, your employees were working from home, and then your company decided to go strictly remotely two months in. Why did you make that decision? I see as a small company, we're, we're you know, almost 100 people. And we start off life with one office, then we, we had two offices. Before the pandemic, we had an equal distribution of people between the two offices. As we thought about what constrained our business, it was ultimately the scarcity of talent. There's an infinite number of um, benefits to me to being able to uh, move to the cloud, so to speak, and be agnostic to location. A lot of companies kind of have this um, idea or maybe like this, it's just ingrained in how things have been done for a very long time, so it just becomes the, the norm, where if you want to work for us, you have to come to where we are. Before COVID, we invested an enormous amount of time and effort to create a fantastic work environment. I wanted the workspace to be really special because I spent, you know, more waking hours at the office than I did at home. One of the things we're really proud of is we had a very, very strong in-office culture. It's really amazing when you think about COVID as this catalytic event that really uh, radically moved forward, accelerated the digitization of life. It's so interesting that you're saying this because it's, it's very rare you hear um, that from you know, the CEO of a company. I think there's this idea that we need to come into the office, um, it's part of our culture. It, it profoundly changed the way that I've thought about work and space, and I feel quite resentful for not having seen this earlier, mm -hmm. which was having this dogmatic belief that even in the, the, this day and age where we have access to such amazing connectivity mm -hmm. and technology, that somehow for so many years I've unnecessarily inflicted 
so much agony and pain and wasted energy and time on my team for forcing them to travel, you know, anywhere between half an hour to multiple hours a day to do what? To have them um, show up and, and go to a space where uh, they are using the exact same device pretty much as they have at home, with the exact access to the internet that they have at home. The world has changed so much, but we seem to be still living on these um, ideas from many generations ago. Something like 70 to 80% of the office space is for individual work. And the, the only time you really, like you're, you're using the office in a way that you can't do at home is when you're collaborating, when you're actually in person, in a meeting, collaborating with each other. Why are we forcing people to make this uh, trade-off of you know, paying a lot to be close to the work um, or, or having to commute a lot. So now you don't have like an office for any employees to go in. What's been the reaction from the people that work for you? It's not hard to see how much happier somebody can be mm -hmm. if you know, they are either now no longer having to commute. That allows them to do better than their best work. Mm -hmm. Simply, they are just happier because they've got a more flexible schedule mm -hmm. because what this new remote work environment forces us to do is to focus on what actually matters. Which output. is the work, yeah. The output. Yeah. It's shocking to me um, how well we've done as a society in adapting to remote work, actually. Mm -hmm. And I really hope that we don't go back to the dogmatic belief of having a physical office space that we all need to go to to work on our digital sewing machines, mm -hmm. that we don't fall back to the industrial era way of thinking about the world, that it was done this way and has to be this way going forward, that you can in fact trust the people that you work with mm -hmm. to do their work. We're back at TVO headquarters where we're going to continue the discussion on reimagining work and we're going to move the conversation online with some special guests and Q&A from you. The pandemic showed us that working from home can be done, and it forces us to think about how we work and how we want to work. But work is not the same for me, for everyone. Uh, I'm Naomi Kiwanuka, and today we want to discuss some of the pain points of the last two years and ask our guests and you, our online audience, how we might move forward a bit differently. Whether you work in an office or the front line, is change even possible? And as one person I spoke to recently said, is quitting a revolutionary act? To start, let's have our guests introduce themselves, where they are, and say a bit about what they do. Vass, I'll start with you. Hi, my name is Vass Bednar. I work at McMaster University, where I'm the executive director of the MPP and Digital Society program. So I get to teach and do research all about public policy and technology. Hey, Vass. Hey. <laughs> Hi, Siobhan. Hey. Can you introduce yourself and where you're from? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Siobhan John. I am based in Toronto and I'm a workplace wellness specialist working at uh, Shopify. So I, I lead our global wellness team, uh, so focusing on employee well-being strategy. And Kalisha? Hi, my name is Kalisha and I live in Shelburne, but I work in Mississauga. I've been a grocery store front end manager and I've worked in the business for about 16 years. Thank you all for being with us. Um, we've got a lot to talk about and I'm excited. So hello to our online audience and hello to the guests. Um, so let's get started. You may have heard about the great resignation or the great migration. People are quitting in large numbers as we move through the pandemic. Let's look at some stats to see how common the feeling of dissatisfaction is or how many people want work to change. A recent LifeWork survey found that as the pandemic continues, 30% of Canadians have altered their career goals, with workers aged 40 and under more likely to want to change careers. 68% of the 3,000 working age people polled said they won't be making changes to their career, but 9% said they would and 23% are unsure. Of workers wanting to make a change, 30% are considering re retraining for a different career, while 24% are thinking of moving to a different role, and 21% are considering retiring. I wish I could consider retiring. <laughs> In addition, a recent Amazon business poll also found that 43% of workers are likely to look for a new job if asked to return 
to the office full time. Uh, Vass, I want to start with you. Uh, the stats that we just saw, can, we, can you put those stats into context for us? Why are people itching for a change? Well, I think the whole context of the pandemic creates an opportunity for us to be a little bit more introspective and reflective about the work that we do, the way we live our lives. I think when we stripped away for so many workers, at least I'll say the theater of work, right? If you're not going to a workplace, you're dressing differently, your hours are different, you change, you, your perspective on, on what it means to work, what work is, could evolve. So I think that's led people to contemplate other opportunities and also recognize that they have the opportunity to make a change with their feet if they're you know, courted by another firm or reskilling as, as we saw in those numbers. In the early stages of the pandemic, 100,000 women left the workforce in this country. Uh, economists have said that it set women in the workplace uh, back a generation. While some of it has been recovered, how much of the idea of the great resignation has been because of this? I think we definitely need to do more to understand the women, the families that are making that decision and that Again, we call it a choice sometimes, but for so many families, it's not a choice that they're making. And in terms of setting women back, I do think firms generally recognize that people of all genders and a diverse workplace is of high value and of interest to them. The question remains to be seen independently of Ontario potentially signing a $10 a day childcare agreement. How is the workplace going to shift to accommodate the reality of parenthood? And uh, Kalisha, yeah, I think so much has changed, but um, not everybody, it hasn't been the same for everybody during uh, this pandemic. A lot of people have been able to work from home. Uh, some people have gone in sometimes and worked from home the rest of the time. But for essential workers like you, you've been expected to show up in person um, and you didn't get the opportunity to work from home. Does even the idea of reimagining work leave essential workers out? While I do think, um... It is such a good thing that like, I guess we experienced this because now there's this hybrid work life that kind of would allow a better work life balance. So it's just something definitely that like I look to and I'm just like, there's no way like I would ever have that opportunity with the kind of job that I have. With where I am, like I have to be there every day. It's so important. If I don't show up to work, then it's leaving them shorthanded. So it's just for frontline workers, it's very hard to see any kind of work-life balance coming like that. Like, it's very hard for us to work from home. We have to be there in person every day. And because you have to be uh, in person, Kalisha, what do you think employers can do to kind of, I don't know, not pay it back, but just kind of like maybe level the playing field a little bit for those people who do have to go in all the time? I would definitely say paid sick days, number one. I think that that's so important as a frontline worker. Like, we don't have any paid sick days. And if you don't have vacation days, you can't try and take that as an advantage. So you end up just kind of missing out or just coming into work, maybe not feeling the best, but you're there because you have bills to pay. So I definitely think um, some paid sick days would be amazing. Also just, um, they did bring in that hero pay at the beginning of the pandemic, but they also did take that away very fast. So I, I just think that as employers, it would be so important for them to support us by continuing at this hero pay because we're doing the same job we always were doing before this pandemic during this pandemic and after. It's something that we all have to do. We come in every day, we work very hard for these big companies and it would just be very nice to just get some, something back in return. And we're not even asking so much, we're just kind of asking for like a living wage pretty much. While we're having this discussion, we have an online audience listening in to this conversation. And we wanna know if you if you have any questions, put them in the chat and I'll pose them to our panelists um, uh, after we speak. Um, Siobhan, I wanna bring you into this. In the work that you do, how did the pandemic uh, impact the conversation around mental health when it comes to the workplace? Yeah, I think if anything, mental health has been pushed to the forefront. I think there also became a point in this period where there was radical honesty <laughs> at some point where it no longer was enough to just say, hey, I'm fine. And it's like um, making it safe to be able to have those conversations that I may be having a hard time right now. Um, and I think that the pandemic, and I, I wish it didn't take such an extraordinary and uh, traumatic event to have to push wellness and well-being to the forefront. But I think it has really underscored the importance that um, employees are seeking an investment and acknowledgement about their well-being at work. And we no longer can afford to treat it as a nice to have or something that is too taboo to talk about. 
but it's something that is very important and critical um, for employees to be at their best and to feel that they are supported and also to humanize the workplace. That's a really interesting point. What do you mean humanize the workplace? Over the last couple of years, and I think what we've started to realize is that we've kind of really understood that work is more than just these transactional actions and that there's a lot of things that we collectively bring um, to work. Um, we're seeing that especially in how so many folks have been up and uh, upended. Bass kind of mentioned that we talked about earlier about women leaving the workforce, caregivers who've been impacted. Um, we're seeing underrepresented groups who've actually expressed that they have found a bit more solace in remote work. Um, and we're seeing that, I think, in the last couple of years that work wasn't working for everyone. Um, and I think that having the opportunity to um, have more conversations about mental health and wellness or seeing the direct impact that this has had on people. Um, we've got um, a couple of questions and I'm going to ask the question and uh, whoever wants to pick it up, you can let me know. Uh, the first question is from Inial, and I really hope I'm saying the name correctly. And the question is, I'm curious about companies finding out what was driving people to leave the companies I, in an attempt to create a better workplace culture. Vast, do you want to take that? I'll try. So what's driving people to leave companies? I hope companies are collecting data when they lose somebody because it is a loss, though you could also view it as a win depending on where someone is going, the choices, the trade-offs that they're making. Um, one thing we've seen with remote work if for the people that can engage in it is that there are new ways, new skills related to communication that we have to have, right? Uh, being in person at a meeting and, and having certain cues is very different than being in a crowded Zoom Brady Bunch screen. Um, it might also nudge us towards for all the virtues of working from home and being able to, you know, dress more casually, et cetera. Does it create a sort of decision making inertia because we're distracted during important meetings? There's something else on the screen or our cameras off and we're not fully present. Those are the sorts of questions we don't quite know yet. So in terms of what businesses are learning, unfortunately, I don't have a, a great answer for you beyond saying, I hope they are learning and I hope they're amending and evolving their policies. What we saw in the grocery example, in terms of what grocery stores are learning in Canada, grocery stores have record profits in this pandemic and it's not just because of inflation and their frontline workers, the people that are at the front lines serving and engaging with us and taking on that risk are seeing none of those rewards. Shareholders are seeing those rewards. And what we also need is more solidarity between all kinds of people, no matter how you can work to drive towards better policy changes that will affect our friends and our neighbors and our colleagues. Uh, well, Kalisha, I want to follow up with you. You heard what Vast said. Um, grocery stores are seeing record profits. Um, food is costing more because uh, supply chains are being blamed. Um, how do you? What is your response to what um, Vast just said, Kalisha? I completely agree with her. I think that I think that's a huge um, issue that a lot of the people that are applying and a lot of the workers are feeling. Um, in the 16 years that I've been in the business, I haven't seen the turnover rate this high. And I am the type of manager that does speak to the my employees and find out why they're going. And like when I'm, I do a lot of the hiring as well, so I get to see um, the different kind of applicants and they tell me why they're looking for a job. And it's definitely the pay. Like I see a lot of people leaving because they're going for a higher paying job. It's just, they just don't feel like it's, it's, um, it's worth the stress. Like, you know, they're coming in, they have to work these hours, they have to work the weekends, they have to work evenings. Like, it's just, they ask for a lot and they just don't feel like the return is, I guess, high enough right now. This is from Carrie and they write, I love the reference, the theater of work. How has, how has our performance of work changed in the pandemic specifically or generally? How has the performativity of work been reimagined? <laughs> uh, Siobhan, do you want to take that? Yeah, for sure. I think that, especially I was going to speak in the context of like remote work, I think we realized that um, we don't necessarily have to work in a specific office to be able to get things done. And I think we've also learned the value of um, asynchronous and synchronous work. So I think it's really changed the way that we've engaged in work and also made us to kind of, kind of take a more of a clinical uh, view on sort of that performative theater or that productive of what is considered to be productive. Was it actually intentional tasks? Were there tasks that we were doing sort of to perform that productivity? 
or their actual tasks that were moving the needle. And I think in the last couple of years, we've had a closer lens of, you know, the number of meetings that we might have in a day, where we're spending our time, where we can actually pull back time and create some more boundaries between work and life. Well, the pandemic exposed many inequities in our society. It's something that we've been talking about the past two years. Um, a couple of months ago, I spoke to Sarah Jamma, who is the co-founder of the Disability Justice Network of Ontario. Here's what she had to say. We need to reckon with, as a society, the fact that, you know, your worth doesn't come from your ability to be productive. Like, you shouldn't need to work to be valued in this country. And there are many people that cannot work, and that should be okay. But instead, what we have on every level of government is disability conversations tied to employment. Vast, you know, to qualify for CERB, you had to have a job. Uh, so it seemed to place a value on those who could work and a different value on those who couldn't work. Just picking up on what Sarah said, how do we challenge that idea? I think we continue to push forward policy conversations like a basic income in Canada. I think, I know that federally we're thinking about how to reform our employment insurance system. And one thing that strikes me about our conversation so far even is we've sort of parsed out the way we're talking about labor in a binary between uh, more sustained salaried work, it's kind of sa sounding to me, and hourly work. Perhaps in between that are also independent contractors, right? Who likely had a very different experience uh, with work in the pandemic or, you know, people who are, who are billing in particular ways. So thinking about how we all fit into, you know, not just the labor market, but as Sarah was saying, you know, our society and where our value comes from independently, but also how we're valuing each other is, is very critical. There are very different types of work in this country. I think part of the reason um, that people, well, businesses, the man, mm. uh, before was like, <laughs> this working from home doesn't work because there seems to be like a trust issue where I need to see my employees in person. I need to see them in the building so that I know that they're doing their work. But through the pandemic, something else came out uh, with surveillance. Can you touch on that? Sure. So we've informally observed the increasing surveillance or datification of workers of all kinds. Um, this is exemplified by the Amazon pick rate, which you've maybe heard of. So we all, all likely had experiences with Amazon in the pandemic. That pick rate has gone up to about 600 items per hour for those workers that are sometimes doing 10 to 12 hour shifts. And just like grocery workers, they're not seeing the returns from the productivity gains that Amazon is seeing. So the kind of surveillance that service and retail workers have been seeing for years in terms of how long does it take for you to check out a customer or, or you know take an order is spilling over everywhere i would say it's good only in so far as it creates more alarm and more awareness to get that kind of cross worker uh, solidarity and awareness that we need. And we are starting to see policy interventions in other jurisdictions that are very promising that Ontario could be thinking about uh, in regards to datification in particular. I know it's not a cool word. I wish I had a cooler word. But with surveillance, we've seen Premier Ford recently make an announcement that they are going to make it mandatory for firms to at least be disclosing when, when and how they're kind of watching workers. And I think that's promising. They can improve upon it with with forthcoming privacy legislation, but it's it's an important conversation to start having. And it's a scary one. It is a very scary one. Um, and Siobhan, just to bring you back in, again, not all workers have had the same experiences in this uh, uh, pandemic. And another uh, policy that the government had put forward was this right to you know, disconnect after a certain hour. I don't want to get any emails. I don't want to, uh, although every time I see an email, I'm like, should I open it now? Of course I'm going to open it now. I'm not going to wait until tomorrow. Yeah. And then we've during the pandemic, oh. we've heard of uh, people working in factories in Brampton uh, we're working in closed quarters, COVID outbreaks, Not didn't have the ability to work from home. So we've been talking about these inequities that the pandemic um, has exposed. How do these in inequities be addressed going forward? Oh, so you'd mentioned, Nam, like the work, right to disconnect type laws. Um, when we think about things like organizations, we're thinking about hybrid versus um, returning completely to in an office. It's really important for organizations to um, not take a one-size-fits-all approach when it comes to creating and crafting new policies or even assuming that their employees are going to have the same emotions or feelings about um, the changes that are implemented. 
So I think it really takes a, a, a an understanding of learning about your employees, it, you know, soliciting feedback, feedback um, really taking an intersectional lens and approach of realizing that your employees have different needs. They might have different types of roles to really ensure that creating a holistic plan that really considers that the different needs and, and specifications that employees are needing in this time and really uh, grounding flexibility in part of that. I have another question from um, someone who's watching in our audience online. This question is from Kim. Um, she writes, uh, or they write, I find many employers are ignoring the racialized employees who mention working remotely has lessened the microaggressions we face in the office. Can panelists discuss how to address this major concern with employers? Um, Kalisha, do you wanna start? As a frontline worker, Definitely. Like I see it firsthand, a hundred percent. Like even if it's down to a simple thing as I'm open and I'm trying to take customers because it might be busy and I'm calling customers over and they're just, oh, it's okay. I'll wait. And they'd rather wait in another line. Like it's, it's the responses we get sometimes when I have to enforce a limit because we have a limit on items to make sure that most of the community can get some of these items. And then I have them speaking in their language and I understand certain words. So I, I do get faced with certain racial remarks being thrown at me and I kind of just have to take it and just try and de-escalate the situation without making it a bigger situation. I think that companies definitely need to have some kind of support more so and understanding towards us and the issues that we come across because as racialized people like we get it all the time. Yeah I was just gonna follow up with what Kalisha had mentioned because like I relate to experiencing my progressions in urban organizations that I've been with and and I think for, for folks who are had the opportunity to work remotely, I think what's we're seeing in the research is like folks are who have experienced that are able to be working remotely and having avoiding the ability or to have to deal with microaggressions or racism in the workplace or sort of all these different things. So I think that employers need to take the time to understand. So for folks who may have those concerns about not wanting to return because of microaggressions or not wanting to deal with um, issues with um, uh, a feeling a sense of belonging or if they don't feel a sense of belonging, get to the root of that um, and creating an organization that makes it feel safe for all of your employees. When you think of uh, the time right now, we've seen like an increase of hate crimes against Asian communities. And if folks are thinking about, for example, of doing a full return to work, are folks going to feel safe going back to work? Um, so I think all of these types of things need to be taken into consideration and the importance of listening to your employees. And if an employee is also feeling uncomfortable, raising those concerns with your organization. Well, I want to switch our focus a little bit and talk about solutions. Um, I spoke to Don McLeod in Zora, a township uh, that's east of London, Ontario, about some benefits of their shift to a four-day work week. Let's take a listen. I think it's a, it's a great time to reflect and that's what got us to this point was looking at how we were working and what we could do differently to make our employees happier and also to improve our retention and also as well as our recruitment. Uh, that's one thing I think politicians will have to be really careful of over the next little while and we're seeing it now is trying to um, recruit smart people into municipal government. It's, it's a challenge. Um, anything that we can do, any tools in our toolbox will certainly make this a lot easier and we found that this has really worked for us in uh, being able to retain some of our younger, smarter employees. Um, I think it's so incredible that um, a township like Zora is leading the way of innovation because I think most of us would think, oh, maybe Toronto could be that place that does this. But um, hi to everybody in Zora. Vas, uh, Zora is a small community of less than 10,000 people. So maybe. Some people might say a four-day work week is easier to implement there. Um, how can it be scaled up to bigger companies and in bigger cities? Well, we sometimes see private companies that have something like summer Fridays, every other Friday off, or no meeting Wednesdays where you're still working, but you're kind of protecting time so you can get a different kind of work done. Again, I think the four-day week work week is something that's going to be more the purview of business on the private side, rather than something that will be formalized and mandated from a government perspective. I don't see a strong role for the state there, um, but it will be interesting to see that grow, again, as part of talent attraction and retention, and also that question of productivity, right? For so long, 
like we have huge productivity problems in the country, not just the province, but our key input is humans, right? People, people power our talent. So if we're able to have bigger and better conversations about what it means to have engaged, satisfied and energized talent, and if that optimal work time isn't this historical 37.5, 40 hours a week that we've had, great, we'll be better for it if we allow ourselves to lean into it. Um, our conversation is almost done, but I wanted to ask uh, a final question from all of you, really just your thoughts. As we move towards reopening in this province, how would you like work to be reimagined? Kalisha, I'll, I'll start with you. I think that, number one, we're just going to have to respect each other. Number one, I think that we just have to respect people and their choices and their feelings and how they are, like the paces that they kind of want to move back into going back to the old normal, I guess. Like even just with the mask mandate being lifted, like I just, I ask for people to just be kind. Like I already have seen issues at work where, you know, people don't want to go through certain cashiers because they're not wearing the mask and they would like them to wear the mask. So I just kind of, I just want people to make informed decisions, like know what they're speaking about, understand the virus and how it works and just kind of respect people and their boundaries and the pace that they're moving at. And Vass? Government needs to do more to stop making it okay for technology firms of all sizes to exploit workers in ways big and small. That's low hanging fruit. I think we also need to make sure that we're paying people properly, that we value them in the marketplace, right? Even personal support workers, frontline workers that are long term care homes that have been, you know, a, a huge through line of this pandemic and a horrific one. We can do better. We know we can do better and it's up to us. And And the last thing is, I think politicians need to do more job shadowing and get off Zoom and get off Teams and understand what people are experiencing and feeling all across Ontario um, as, as frontline workers, but also as maybe even workers working from home and navigating whatever this new normal is. I'm so reluctant to say the word normal. It used to be a normal word and it doesn't feel that way anymore. Just like emergency and pandemic used to be special words, but they feel more normal than anything else. And we need to retire pivot. Um, yeah. Siobhan and Siobhan. I would say that for the future, it's important for have workplaces that are grounded in compassion and empathy. Over the last two years, our collective wellness has been dramatically impacted. And I think that it's important as we reimagine workplaces for the future that we continue to center wellness and mental health. A big thank you to our guests and to everybody who joined us online. We really do appreciate your time and your questions. To catch up on The Thread, you can log on to tbl.org or on YouTube, The Thread with Nam Kiwanuka. And we'll see you next month. Bye.